wonderful to be here. And um, I wanted to begin this morning by just having us each take a brief pause and even close our eyes and reflect on, try and re recall, try and bring up uh, one of your first, maybe the first, contact that you personally had with the Dhamma. That might be hearing a lecture, it might be finding a book, it might very well have been meeting a person. And just remember that time in your life where there was a there was a turning, there was an opening of the heart. And for many of us, it was uh, many of us. It, it's a very salient time. Is a very specific memory. And it might not have been your very first contact with the Dhamma. It might have, you know, that seed might have landed, but then somehow there was enough water, enough fertilization that something began to take root. And this is a very beautiful thing for us to uh, recall, to bring to mind to bring up in the heart. I actually remember Ajahn uh, Nisabo and Ajahn Kovalo came to the monastery that I used to live at in California um, almost a year ago. And uh, I, I, uh, they were there for three days. And many times I heard Ajahn Nisabo ask that question specifically to uh, to the monastics, to the, to the aspirants, to the lay people. So it's a very wonderful thing for us to touch into. And what, what happens at that moment is what the suttas describe over and over, whenever they're describing the, the gradual path, which is really just a, a fleshed out human description of what the Eightfold Noble Path looks like when it goes from being a list to being a lived experience, this gradual training. The gradual training always, always begins with a Tathagata arises in the world. That we have this incredible privilege. We need to pinch ourselves that we live in a time that there is a Buddha Sasana. And then it goes, it, it, it gets better. You know, that was our lot lottery ticket. And then we actually won the lottery when we're here in a human body and we've personally come in contact with the Buddha's teachings and something has, has landed and, and been uh, important and been meaningful in our lives. And in the gradual training, this is, this is when there's a faith response to the Tathagata. There's a faith response to the Buddha. There's a faith response to the Dhamma. And this is the beginning. This is the right, you know, the Eightfold Noble Path begins with right view. We have to have enough of a, of a right understanding. Even if we, we understand very little, but we understand, oh, there's something here. This is the way to go. And sometimes um, in the United States, in Canada, uh, faith can be something that uh, is, uh, can be mud muddy and, and muddled and complex for people that have maybe had um, some um, unproductive or even difficult experiences with faith teachings. And in the Buddha's teachings, faith, sada, the Pali word faith, is, can also be translated as confidence, can also even be translated as trust, that 
And, and I, I heard a description not long ago, uh, a sort of a, a bigger description of this idea of confidence, sort of specifying what that confidence is. And the confidence is in the reality, the reality, the truth of possibilities. You know, the, the Buddha says that uh, when, when we're still in our ignorance, when we're still in our confusion, in our delusion, our response to our life, our response to suffering has, has two main themes to it. This is in the, um, it's recorded for us in the Anguttara Nikaya, uh, in, the, in the Book of Sixes, uh, Sutta 63. It's about penetrative things, things that we need to penetrate. And the Buddha is describing there that uh, our initial response often to our suffering is one of two things. One is that we get very overwhelmed, confused, uh, perplexed, and the other is that we start to go on this search outside of ourselves for a rescuer, like like fix it. And, and the Sutta actually says, you know, you go to someone and just say, do you have a word or two, a mantra that can fix this? And, and we see these two uh, forces in the human heart and in the human mind very much in our culture people very overwhelmed um, and, and, and confused, and also people pretty uh, uh, fixated on some kind of rescue. All of our fairy tales, uh, women, we have this very much, you know, waiting to be in some special relationship. Um, I, I had a challenge today, um, you know, our obsession with celebrities and movie stars and people like Taylor Swift. I did it. <laughs> the, this, the, Buddha, the Buddha predicted this. The Buddha talked about this. Yeah. And, uh, but there's a third option, and it's this option of, of, of faith and of, of beginning a spiritual practice and then walking the practice, developing the practice, and um, really... Uh, developing it all the way. And this is uh, described very exquisitely when the Buddha talks about liberative dependent origination. It, and this is recorded for us in many places. One place is the Samyutta Nikaya uh, at 12, 23. Uh, and the, it, uh, Monte Sujato translates it as vital vital condition, Bhikkhu Bodhi translated, translates it as the proximate cause. But the proximate cause, the, the thing, you know, the fertilizer, the right environment for faith to take, to take root and begin to grow, it's really significant what the Buddha says. It's suffering. Suffering is what will cause us to... Um, you know, initially we can have some overwhelm and confusion. We can we can try some things, you know, reaching outside of ourselves that don't work. And then this third option, hopefully we start a spiritual practice. And faith, uh, the thing that um, fertilizes and feeds and grows our faith is suffering. It's just such a... Typical of the Buddha, you know, everything everything can turn out to be really useful. There's nothing that we can't grow from. And in fact, typically we have to grow from things that uh, we, we, would, we would maybe have chosen to grow from something <laughs> different. <laughs> but invariably, we have the perfect teacher with us, which is our suffering. And this whole idea of our faith being this this confidence, this um, you know uh, uh, orient uh, an orientation towards uh, following the Buddha's teachings to lead us out of suffering. You know, no matter what, uh, we're 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 
putting our trust, we're putting our confidence in something. And you can look at your life and uh, ask yourself, what, what am I putting my faith in? What, what's the overarching, what's, what's the overarching orientation in my life? And, and you can answer that question by asking yourself another question, like, how, how am I spending my time? How am I spending my energy? How am I spending my money? W where, where are my, my uh, deepest hopes and aspirations and, and dreams? And this, this can uh, be a, a pointer for you in your life about what you're putting your faith in. And I, I want to speak this morning just encouraging all of us to put more of our faith in the Buddha and in the Buddha's teachings. The Buddha, um, he, he was a Buddha, and each Buddha that's ever arisen has 10, ten powers. And uh, the Buddha speaks of this often. And the first power that a Buddha has is to know what's possible and what's impossible. And uh, actually, this, this power that the Buddha has uh, if you if you go on Suda Central and put in possible, you know, you, you get hundreds, hundreds of times the Buddha uses this paradigm, this framework, to speak about um, about the path, to speak to, to speak about the mind, speak about meditation, speak about our lives, speak about our hindrances. And he's always telling us this is possible and this is not possible. And so to think about faith as this sureness this this like putting all your eggs in this basket that that yes there's the reality of possibilities and and I don't need to figure that out myself I can just listen to the buddha and it's very very possible for us to experience deep peace and deep meditation and powerful insights it's possible for us to purify our minds the buddha is telling us this and it's really, really true. And often we need to be reminded. I think the Buddha sometimes <laughs> is talking about what's possible and what's impossible so much because at times it feels impossible. But he's saying, no, 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 it actually is possible. There's a, a, a this paradigm is, is, I find this very, um, very practical and very helpful in my own life. And, and I can see it in the, in the physical world. You know, um, if I think that something's possible, I, I, you know, I tend to um, not get nearly so anxious about it and stay much more equanimous and then also put much more energy into um, the, the effort of, of um, carrying out the task. I've I, um, been a nun for over 10 years and the other two monasteries that I've lived in, I've always been the work nun. And I've always had these jobs that, I, you know, I had never done in lay life, like installing toilets and, uh, you know, changing out faucets and doing drywall. And uh, invariably, if I would think, you know, even, even to unscrewing something, if I was, if I had doubt or unsureness, like, do these two things come apart? I, then I couldn't, I couldn't get them apart. But if I knew for sure, no, it's really clear, or I've read the, you know, I've gone on the Google and, done, you know, then even though, I, you know, I just be, just the confidence, I would be able to unscrew something. It's that, it's that simple. There's a fantastic story of uh, economics um, student. He was a grad student at UC Berkeley. Some people might well know this story, and people in our community know it really well because I tell it all the time. Um, so bear with me. But uh, this actually happened in 1939, and this is at UC Berkeley in California. There's a, a student, a grad student. His name was uh, George Dantzig, and he uh, s overslept this one morning, and he gets to his seminar class late. And, and he gets there, and there are these two questions that are written out on the board. And he, he gets there halfway through the class. He's really overslept. 
So anyway, he writes down the two questions, thinking for sure that they're the homework, and uh, and is struggling to get these two questions answered, and uh, so much so he didn't he didn't get the homework finished on time for the class the next week. He turns it in a few days late and goes to the profs a bit sheepishly, you know, like, will you accept this? And the profs like, certainly. <laughs> anyway, these two questions at the time in 1939 were considered impossible. The, the, the prof had put these two questions on the board as these are unsolvable at this point in statistics. But George Danzig never heard that. And he thought it was his homework. And he solved them, both of them. And you know, you fast forward a, a year or two, and he's struggling with what to write his thesis on. And Prof's like, seriously, don't worry about it. Just put those two, two answers in a binder, and you are good to go, <laughs> you know? And uh, he went on and had a brilliant career and received some honorary from uh, uh, President Ford. Um, anyway, it this this is the issue. I think I'm um, preaching to myself here. You know, this is a big issue for us. I think sometimes that there are, uh, um, you know, unacknowledged subconscious limits that we are putting on ourselves that. Um, I just want to encourage us to really uh, explore that, really get courageous and honest. Uh, you know, sometimes we have beliefs that we're not even really fully in touch with, but they're like these shadows that are hanging over our lives. They're hanging over our relationships. Uh, we think that, you know, somehow I'm just not completely lovable, you know, I, somehow I'm not good enough. Uh, there isn't, you know, I'll always be alone. There isn't real love for me. There isn't real love in the world. Uh, some of these are just, it's like they're, they're in ourselves, you know, they've been in some water that we've been drinking for a long time. And the Buddha is saying otherwise, very much. And there's a lot of evidence in all of our lives here we are, you know, so much of the path is, has begun to happen. We, we're here, we've heard the Dhamma, we love the Dhamma, we've made a commitment to the Dhamma, uh, we're, we're on the path. And to really, really uh, think about, you know, the Buddha talked about what's possible and what's impossible. And maybe we could just pretend that we got to the we got to the meeting late, and we didn't know, you know, stream entry was uh, that's our homework, and and we're supposed to do it uh, because we can, we really really can. We we can experience deep peace, we can experience deep meditation, and we can experience powerful insights. Each each and every one of us. Um, so many causes and conditions are already in place for this to happen. What's possible and what's not possible. And the, the Buddha is asking us to really deeply, deeply trust him. And he's totally worthy of trust. And we can put our faith in goodness, not because of goodness, but because the Buddha's taught us. He's teaching us. This is the path that you, bit by bit, brick by brick, you purify your own mind. You, 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 you pound out a coarse peg with a more fine peg. You know, the more that we are cultivating wholesome mind states. This is something we can put our faith in, and it begins to have momentum. And there's so many beautiful passages in the suttas like that, that it's, you know, it, it's, it's drop by drop, but then we're filling a whole 
canyon and then and then and then it, it gains momentum and it rushes down it becomes a river powerful river it can be wonderful to stand in nature and just watch what a river's done to bedrock and just think that that's the dhamma that's what i'm doing every time you know i wake up in the morning and i remember an aspiration every time i bow to the buddha every time i encourage a kalyanamitta every time I sit down on the cushion, drop by drop, this is very, very possible. But I, I just want to end uh, this morning's uh, Dhamma reflection with, with leaving you with those two questions. You know, what, what am I putting my faith in? And what do I really, like, really got? believe is possible for me in this life. And, you know, perhaps raise the bar. And, and what happens is when we have confidence that something can happen, it feeds energy. And, and faith, faith, trust, confidence, this is, this is what allows for letting go. You can't really let go until there's this the solid confidence and, and safety. And the Buddha is the thing that we need to be putting our faith in. So I'll, I'll end here. Thank you, Ida. Um, so we'll open it up to questions. Um, so we, I think we have, do we have any mics? This mic? So this mic will go around, and if anyone has a question, you can just raise your hand, and same goes with uh, people on Zoom. You can just raise your uh, little hand in the upper corner, and yep, you can ask a question. Maybe since we have just have uh, the Aya here today, then somewhat questions for the Aya, but it could be more more broad as well. Yep. Sure. And uh, I also said Anagarika Sarah is open for questions too, so we have two for one today as well. All right. Hello. My name is Sam, and thank you so much for the talk, Aya. And I have a question for both of y'all. I do recognize unconsciously lots of limits, for sure, all the time. And coming here, I definitely see already like some some of like you know problematic patterns going away, and I have more wholesome states and stuff, so I see the faith in that path, so it's great. But this might be a, a troublesome question, but it feels difficult for me right now to have faith in the Buddha, if that makes sense, because it's like, okay, he lived 2,600 years ago, these things are written down, it's like, okay, it's like, who knows maybe what was written between that, or it's like, super, super skeptical, sorry. But it is, I can feel like I have faith in, you know, the Ajans or the Kuba Ajans or, you know, all, all these deep practitioners. But, yeah, not sure if that's something more flimsy or something. I'm not sure if it's an exact question, but if you want to comment or say nothing, both of those things are fine. So, yeah. Uh, I super appreciate your question, Sam. And I think that's true for many of us, and that's actually why I, ta I said I was talking to myself. This is why I was talking about this. I uh, honestly feel like um, I'm more and more interested in, in learning about and thinking about and trying to cultivate faith in my own life. Um, and I think that uh, 
the fact that you have access to samanas and that you and you trust them uh, this is good enough you know we have the triple gem to uh, take refuge in the buddha the dhamma and the sangha and there's different ones of those are um, more real more meaningful uh, more accessible for for different ones of us and um, so you you've got you've got enough you've got enough faith in the sangha and then you're you're gaining faith in the dhamma as you practice and you're seeing the fruit of the practice and this this is it just then becomes this wonderful virtuous feedback loop so don't make a problem when there's no problem you know just relax and and look at where your faith is and where your faith is working and just continue to um, to uh, know that. I mean, sometimes that's interesting. We, we, we don't realize that all the faith that we do have. I think it, it's a real, it's just a real putting, putting the, the attention on the things that are, are working and just go with those. Yeah, I mean, it, you read the suttas, the Buddha gave such different instructions to different people. And uh, and I, at where I first ordained the at times the um, the nun Aya Maida Nandi that I was training with would would make that um, statement at the end of of uh, uh, an instruction that she gave me or a feedback that she gave me like whatever's useful take it and whatever isn't working or is problematic or doesn't apply just put it to the side. I remember when I showed up there, I had had a difficult I interaction with someone that ha had been the source of great faith for me, and she just said, very, you know, you don't need to take everything on the menu. <laughs> yeah. Is that helpful? Yeah. Oh. Makes me feel happy. Yes. Yeah. Helpful. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Um, uh, I, so I was encouraged, uh, well, actually we wanted to see Anagarka Sarah's ask you about your path to robes, uh, white robes at this point, but I was told to refine that question because apparently there's a really great story between how you became interested in Dhamma. So, uh, Anagarka Sarah, would you share, share some of your story with us? Um, hello everyone. <laughs> uh, I don't know how great a story it is, <laughs> but I can share what was referred to earlier. Um, I suppose it ties into what I was talking about with uh, our first contact with the Dhamma. Sometimes it's just a seed that's planted that doesn't really grow or come to fruit until much later. And uh, in Canmore, we were um, discussing one day um, this topic. And I told the story of when I was in university, before I considered myself a, a dumb, before I knew anything about the Dhamma. I knew nothing about the Buddha, the Four Noble Truths, nothing. And I was studying environmental science because I was actually so um, discouraged with humanity that I thought, I'll just learn how the earth works. <laughs> and among my study uh, subjects was uh, ecology and religion. And I was doing a paper on um, different ways that uh, different religions were responding to the ecological crisis. And one of the papers I was reading as I was doing a literature review, there was a Buddhist scholar who mentioned this one phrase, I still remember it very clearly in my mind, the source of the ecological crisis is tangha. And at the time, I had no idea what Tangha was. <laughs> I didn't even know what language it was written in. But I remember 
seeing that word and my mind just went, that's it. <laughs> um, so one could say that a seed was planted and much, much later uh, when I encountered the Dhamma in a more substantial way, that message solidified and became very clear. Um, sorry, thank you. Tangha is the Pali word for thirst or craving, wanting something that's not there or being dissatisfied with what is there, thinking things should be other than they are. The whole sentence, the sentence that I read, the source of the ecological crisis is tangha. So in other words, saying that it's the, the insatiable thirst that we humans have uh, that is at the root of our environmental issues. Yeah. And craving, craving. T-A-N-H-A. Tangha, Tangha, T A N H A. Yes, yeah. Um, and so my path to the robes beca began through meditation, um, you know, exploring yoga and Goenka Vipassana retreats, 10 day retreats, and eventually coming to a point in my life where uh, I had a very good life, lots of friends, a good job, a wonderful partner, but this tangha, this dissatisfaction, <laughs> this general frustration despite my ideal conditions. And I encountered um, shortly after the teachings of a monk named Bhante Vimalaramsi who um, taught me a way to meditate that really resonated with me, that I took off with, that made sense. And uh, that led me to explore monasticism. What, who are these people who are devoting their lives to the Dhamma? And how do they live? And can women do this? So I did some monastery hopping and I was a steward for a couple of years at Birken Forest Monastery in British Columbia with Bodhi Pala and other good Kalyanamitas. And then went bopping around California where I met Aya Ahimsa. And um, conditions came together to live in Canmore in Canada, Alberta, where we're thanks to Sangamitta, able to practice the Dhamma and share it with an already well-established community at the Canmore Monastery. That's, that's a little bit of my story. I had a question right, right here. I'm Luis. A um, good friend of mine lost her husband last week. And I was reflecting on the, the fourth remembrance, the one about that everybody we love is swept away with the impermanence of it all. And I was thinking there's something really comforting in the belief that there is some intangible bond that lasts afterwards. But what is that if that exists? Or is that just a delusion, something we tell ourselves to feel better? Yeah, good, good question. Um, and perhaps if you feel comfortable, you can say the name of that person at the end when we dedicate goodness, Luis. Um, for right view, the Buddha gives two versions. Uh, there's transcendent right view, which is the Four Noble Truths. So this method of looking at experience in terms of seeing our dukkha, 
uh, suffering, comprehending it, and the second of letting go of tanha, craving, thirst, which is what uh, Anagarika Sarah was pointing to, the third of realizing peace, and the fourth of developing the path of uh, the Noble Eightfold Path. And that's this unbelievable, uh, simple, and uh, incisive way of looking at experience to purify the mind and let go of our struggle uh, into a, a place of peace and selflessness and kindness. But the Buddha also gives mundane right view, which is uh, a list of uh, ways of looking at the world. Um, there is uh, the fruit of good and bad actions, so belief in cause and effect, uh, and that also implies the belief in us able to affect the cause of purification on our own hearts, the ability to change. Um, and there's quite a few in this list, but one is uh, there is mother and father. And for me, that's the Buddha's pointing to the reality of certain karmic bonds in our lives that really are meaningful and remain. Um, and, you know, on... Yes, in a Buddhist worldview, there is uh, a citta, a, uh, there is a continuity after death of kama. Um, and part of that kama is a uh, bond uh, with those we've developed bonds with in life. Um, as to exactly what composes that bond and, you know, what material it's made of, et cetera, et cetera, the Buddha just... Uh, it was one of those questions the Buddha put aside as not uh, essential for uh, ending suffering um, in terms of exactly what that what that is. But if uh, you know if there is any interest in that, you can. There's uh, a book called Life Before Life, which is a beautiful elaboration uh, on on rebirth and stories of children remembering past lives, etc., which can give a measure of faith. But I'd say that even if one has trouble believing in that side of things, uh, just acknowledging that that memory in people and that goodness carries on. You know, in, in Buddhism, we talk about sankara, which are these formations and patterns of goodness, of, uh, of de, you know, or unskillful ones, of delusion. And when someone leaves, that sankara of goodness and love remains. And really caring for that sankhara, that memory, that relationship after their death is not meaningless at all. Um, that sankhara, if it's carefully watered and cultivated, if you do goodness in the name of the person that's passed, if you remember what they would want you to do with your life, it can be a huge, you know, it can be a beautiful thing. And so even if you don't believe in an afterlife or a rebirth or whatever. In Buddhism, this is the afterlife, actually. So, uh, because we've been born before, so it goes. Um, but yeah, even without that, the recollection and uh, purification of that relationship is, is still meaningful. So, Ajahn? There's one little piece of marriage advice that the Buddha gave. Um, you know, he's a monk, but uh, he could talk to this kind of thing and uh, even say before someone passes away, if you want to strengthen a bond um, with someone, a connection with someone, you can do certain things. Uh, this uh, husband comes to the Buddha and says, uh, he's, not a, he's not a monk, not inclined in that direction. He says, how can it be that in future lives I can have this connection with this, with my partner, with my, wa with my wife, uh, Nakula Pita was his name. And the Buddha says, basically, have similar faith. So... See if you can have the same object of faith, the same kind of faith. Do similar generosity. So try to do acts of goodness together, sharing things with other people in the same ways. See if you can have the same view. Um, so talk about your views with your, your partner, the person who you want to create that connection with. And by doing these things, uh, it will incline, you know, you'll incline in the same direction uh, as the person who you're, you're doing these things with. Uh, we can have a Zoom question. I can't see who that is. Okay. Anita? Or Mary? <laughs> I 
think you can unmute yourself and see if we can hear you. And Mary? Okay, I think we do have time for one or two more questions. Thank you for uh, bringing in the concepts of uh, faith, uh, possibility, and impossibility. My question is, some people may actually have a very strong faith on the impossibility of things. Uh, some examples could be that they can find happiness with money or what, what not. But if they have a strong faith on impossible things, what can other persons who are seeing that faith in impossibility in them, what can they do to kind of change their faith? That's a good framing. I didn't get your name. Chetan. Chetan? Chetan. Um, yeah, faith in the impossible. Yeah, that something's impossible. I, I, I do think that many of us have that, this, this uh, limitation in, a, in our in our thinking, and then that affects our actions. Yeah. It, yeah. Oh, they have a faith in something that's impossible? Ah, uh, thank you, thank you. Ah. Uh. <laughs> I think that the answer to that is the same as um, the answer to many questions about uh, other people, you know. I think we need to um, dress back in kama, you know, and um, it's hard enough for us to control and direct our own minds. You know, we, we, the, the greatest gift that we can give to anyone is to cultivate the path as much as possible in our own life. And, um, I think as you get to know the Buddha's teachings more and more, you might be able to, um, at the right time and in the right way, use particular specific um, circumstances that, that are shared between you and this other person and talk about how you view it. I mean, other people might want to chime in here. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's interesting. There is a sutta where um, someone goes to a, a, a novice monk and is asking for the teachings, and then the novice monk tries, he de kind of declines. Well, you know, I, really, it'd be better if you talk to the Buddha, and then, no, no, no. And then he tries to give the person who's asking teachings, and then he goes, you know, this happens in the suttas all the time. And then the entire conversation <laughs> is repeated to the Buddha. And the Buddha, I find it almost a bit harsh. The, well, if you'd thought of this simile, it would have, you know, would have made all the difference. Um, so just, if you can be as clever as possible with your similes. <laughs> no, similes are really, really powerful. Yeah. Sorry, I don't know if I've really answered your question. No, that's good. Uh, thank yeah. you. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. I guess I, I would ask you this with everybody. Um, I came to the Dhamma late in life, my late 60s, and your discussion of, of confidence and trust and, and faith hits harder with me, perhaps, than with those who are much younger because biologically my path is not going to be as long as many people uh, who are much younger or who've already walked it for decades perhaps. Do you have any thoughts on this? Did the Buddha talk about the more senior practitioner arriving late, if you will? Yeah, well, I'm, I'm in the same boat. <laughs> that late boat. <laughs> yeah, and 
Um, so I think it's even more important for us to not put limits and really have faith. And because the, the limits then limit that kind of effort that we make. That's why I think to really um, go for it. Don't, don't be telling yourself I'm, I'm too old or, you know, my, fa my, don't. I mean, I'm, don't. Don't do that, you know? Yeah. Um, I think you can, you can flip it like I was suggesting to Sam. And this is what I think faith does for us. Um, so it's very natural, very, very natural. So I, I, for myself, I find that's one of the best things. Wow, like, oh wow, this is totally natural, total, totally normal that my mind goes there and I think this. And, and all those other things are true too. I've got a human birth, I've got, you know, you've got your health right now, you've got, the, look what's landed in your, in your backyard. You know, these are all, this is all personal to you. Uh, there's great karma that you've done. And, and, and the Dhamma is meaningful to you. Just, just water it, water it, water it. Get more and more Kalyana Mitta that, and, and figure out more and more things that, that urge you on and encourage you. Yeah. The, and honestly, in terms of age, the only thing I can think of is that there are suttas about it's harder to ordain late. Be and that's because we just get much more rigid, much more less flexible, much more set in our, our views. And yeah. But other than that, I can't think of anything about the Dhamma being. Can you? you no. 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 Yeah. And there, I mean, there are all these suttas. There are suttas where it's not about age, but so I was just reading uh, Majjhima Nikaya 140, where there's this person that that has gone forth, th and they're not older, they're, you know, they're, I, it doesn't say how old they are, but I don't think they're old. And, um, and they've gone forth under the Buddha, but they've never met the Buddha. And then, and then they end up spending the night at this person's house. Um, and, it, and the Buddha spends the night too. And they have this long exchange. And then, and then the, the, the person who's gone forth realizes, oh my gosh, this is the Buddha. The Buddha never says he's the Buddha, but you can tell by his teachings, you know. And then he goes, oh, can, he'd only, he was only a novice. He wants the higher ordination. And the Buddha's like, no, you need, you, do you have your bowl and robes? And he's like, no. And so then the Buddha um, says, well, you need bowl and robes to receive higher ordination. So he goes off to try and get his bowl and robes, and he gets killed by a stray cow. You know, so I, is this to help me? I'm not sure what. <laughs> I, I I think that 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 um and then the followers of the Buddha come to the Buddha and like, you know, kind of like what up? Like you like is this you know what what? And uh, the Buddha says no because he had that interaction with the Buddha. He was actually a non-returner. That just um, I'm just saying we don't sometimes we don't need a lot of. I just want to encourage you. And maybe that story was not the best to tell. <laughs> I, I appreciate the encouragement yeah, without yeah. doubt. I, I was just told we may, we may have less suffering ahead of us being more senior at this point, because, which is a very interesting spin, I must say, yeah. And, and the other thing is, like, um, I was telling this to Anna Garika Sarah just like yesterday or the day before. The, when we're older, some of the things in the suttas, uh, we're like, yeah, we, we know. We know that life is suffering. We know that this doesn't work, that doesn't work. Does it, we've tried them all. So we actually know. So in some ways, our faith and our urgency and our commitment can be more juicy. It's more lived. It's more real. <laughs>